Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. The Tracks by Jester James I'm breaking every single one of my rules for survival doing this, and yet I don't know if I'll die in hunger in a few weeks. Or worse, they'll find me when I'm sleeping and carry me off to where they dwell nestled in the tunnels beneath the city. I stare into the abyssal depths below me, nothing to make out but the motionless escalator stairs poking their way out of the blackness. I take one last deep breath and savor the clean, crisp February air and make my way down to find Nate. <laughs> Nate. He's the greatest survival tool any scav can have. A full-bred German Shepherd who can hear a pin drop a mile away, and he can smell it just as far. I found Nate in an apartment on the sixth day of the crossing, as it was termed by the media at the time. By this time, the portals had opened across the planet in every nation and all manner of demons began to cross over. I'd hidden in my apartment for as long as I could, but I'd been too scared to leave to stock up on supplies in the first days. I had nothing but a Nutrigrain bar and weak old milk lying in the fridge, and I had no choice but to look for food. I searched the apartments around my own, tiptoeing from one to another, almost vomiting at the chaos and gore left in each one, finding little or nothing in the majority of them. Then in number 304, where I had seen a young family with a little girl move in a month before, I found canned food and bottles of spring water. The carpet was soaked in blood, but there were no bodies. I know now where they were brought and what was done to them, and thank God I didn't know at the time or I would never have left the building. In what I took to be the young girl's room, I heard whimpering coming from a small cabinet beside the bed. As I opened the small sliding door on it, I found a puppy, no more than 10 or 12 weeks old at the time. I immediately fell in love. Which is a rare thing when you're standing in an apartment block caked in the remains of its tenants. Ever since then, he's been my closest companion. But no less than 20 minutes ago, one of those demonic fucks grabbed him as I was searching a broken down ambulance near the hospital. I heard a short, painful whimper and rushed out to the street only to see the gangly, malnourished limbs of one of their stalkers vanish into the entrance of the subway on Grayton Street. They don't kill and eat animals the way they do humans. They use them. They change them into one of their own, I guess, after altering their bodies. Dogs are always favored for their tracking skills and they've marked the end for many a survivor. That's why I have to find him. If I can't save him, to release him from the torture and cruelty that bondage to these things entails. The further that I travel down, the stronger the smell of rot and decay becomes, leaving a sickly, bitter taste in the back of my throat. In the past, I would have vomited or had to smear vapor rub on my upper lip to withstand it, but now I've become so accustomed to it, it's like a second nature to me. Every few steps, I find myself standing on the withered remains of those who tried to escape the subway when the portals opened and they crossed over. Those who were trampled beneath the feet of the swarming crowd, escaping through the cracks of a burning building. The bone breaks, cracking beneath my boots every six or seven steps, and I almost stumble downwards on a few. My flashlight only shines ten or twelve feet ahead of me, and ahead of that, I'm met with solid darkness. It's like this for ten or fifteen minutes until I reach the subway floor. The smell is at its worst down here. 
and the floors are littered with bones and filth left over by those ungodly creatures further down the tracks. Suddenly an inhuman shriek rings out from somewhere not far off in the darkness and my heart drops to my stomach like a ton of lead. I turn off my light and go prone on the cold tiles, hearing the thumping against my ribcage and the floor beneath me. I hear a soft pitter-patter running along the ceiling somewhere to my right and listen as it vanishes down the tracks into the depths, perhaps to alert its demonic brethren further down. I stand up slowly, almost expecting to see the creature jump out of the darkness towards me, but nothing. And after a reassuring deep breath, I make my way to the edge of the tracks and drop down. I twist the top of my cheap steel flashlight, and as the light begins to dim, I make my way down the tracks towards their home, towards what I almost know, certainly, to be my death. The shrieks and hungry growls I hear on the way should be enough to force me to turn around and run as fast as I can, back up the tunnel and back to the surface, but I can't abandon Nate, because he's never abandoned me. He's always been loyal, and I know if I do, the shame and guilt I'll hold will kill me quicker than any demon. After what seems like hours, but it's probably no longer than 20 minutes, I come to a junction in the tracks and a train carriage. Once it was lit up like a Christmas tree, full of commuters going about their day. But now it lies decrepit and lifeless, and whatever may be alive within certainly isn't human. The door of the carriage is torn open and hanging by no more than one, maybe two of its hinges. I make my way past the door and into the carriage and the first evidence of those things lies in front of me. Hundreds of prints overlapping one another, left in blood from feet and paws and things that resemble hooves or trotters like those of a pig, but much larger. In some, you can make out the long claws and talons used to disembowel and dismember people like myself, people foolish enough to enter their domain. The howls are louder and closer now and no more than maybe 500 meters in front of me. I don't walk. I crouch down and make my way through the carriage. Small pieces of entrails and viscera lie strewn across the floor of the carriage. I do my best not to stand on them, but I feel the stickiness of the congealed blood and fluids beneath my feet. I can hear them outside the carriages at either side of the crunching bone and soft, wet sound of them devouring flesh. Snorts, growls as they do so. I feel like standing up and running. My whole body and mind are screaming, but as hard as it is, I ignore it and push forward, slowly but surely following in what I can only hope to be the steps of Nate's abductor. I see the end of the carriage in front of me, and once again I go prone and begin crawling towards it, the flashlight slightly illuminating the sides of the door. When I finally make it to it, I'm met with a sight I know will never leave me till the day I die. In front of me, facing away and crouched over Nate, is the figure of the stalker, the skin of its back, pale and with a sickly green hue sores and scabs appearing at intervals across it and its spine jutting out beneath its irregularly long body. Its gangly arms lie by its side and it reminds me of a ghoulish painting that I'd once seen years before the crossing in a basement close to my old home in Boston by an artist called Pickman, I think. In front of it, all around, lay numerous piles of bodies and body parts and the top and between them the demons of all kinds stand horns and snouts jutting out from between the mess while others are covered in thick dark fur slick with the blood of those poor souls brought down here near the top of the closest pile eight or nine meters in front of me 
A demon lies face down with appendages like those of an insect connected to a body which, although malformed, appears human. But all recognition of humanity fades away as I see the antenna on its head like that of a mantis or a beetle, its, its head buried in the torso of what looks like the remains of a woman. At first, I think that Nate is dead. But I see the slow and steady rise and fall of his chest. He's alive. Then I realize this is my one and only chance to save him before he's brought deeper into the tunnels towards whatever dark, evil thing waits to change him into a creature like those around me for use in filling this pit with more sustenance for those things. They don't appear to notice the dim light from the torch, and I leave it on the floor beside me, facing the back of the stalker. I slip my hand down my side and into my belt, and I withdraw the military knife from the holster beneath it. I slowly pull myself forward. Every second seems like minutes, and then slowly I swing my legs down from the carriage and find myself outside, my shadow now printed on the back of the stalker in front of me. I know... One mistake, one wrong move or step, and I'll alert every single creature around me. I feel the sweat begin to build on my forehead and spend a split second planning my attack. I creep to the side of the creature's back, and as my foot steps forward, simultaneously I bring one arm forward along the side of its head, my hand opened to cover the creature's mouth, as the other stabs upward the tip of the blade slicing through the floor of its mouth and up into its brain. I feel its lips move beneath my hand as it attempts to let out a cry, but it's too late, and I feel its body go limp and drop to the floor beneath me. The few seconds afterward is the most alert that I've ever been. I wait to hear the howls of revenge from the other demons sealing my fate, but they never come, and they continue to feast unknowing of what's happened. I slide my hand under Nate and pick him up slowly and carefully and cradle him between my chest and shoulders and slowly crawl back through the carnage. The journey back through the tunnels is twice as fast as the journey down and although I'm still aware of the dangers of alerting one of these creatures, I quicken my pace. Before I know it, I'm hoisting myself back onto the platform next to the tracks. And I feel Nate's body begin to twitch and jerk against me. And just as I near the top of the escalators and feel the sunlight from the surface shine on my face, his eyes flicker open and he licks the side of my cheek. So stay scary, my wildlings. Know who your friends are and what they're worth. And do your best to keep them. And make the most of your nights.